And we are back for another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards. This is my co-host, Jason Todd. Jason, good to have you with us again, my friend. Always a pleasure to be with you, Paul. Looking forward to today's uh, conversation. That's right. We've got a, a longtime friend of mine joining us for the show today. Uh, a, a man in um, who has the a, a tremendous ability to succinctly summarize an idea that it takes me probably two or three paragraphs to get through. He can usually do it in one to two sentences. Uh, he is the founder of Pursuing Results, a, an agency dedicated to helping people launch and grow their podcasts. And he's the author of the book, Micro Famous. Let's welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast, Matt Johnson. Matt, great to have you with us, my friend. How are right. you? I'm doing very well. That was, with that quality of introduction, I feel like you need like an applause track, just oh. <laughs> as, I, as I approach the stage. That's all, that's yeah, all we're, I'm saying. We're going yep. to have some flashes and bangs going off here. Thank you. All right. That's a good update. Yeah, that's a uh, good, good upgrade for sure. <laughs> well, with, also with his introduction of you make things to sync, this is going to be a short conversation. That's right. Five minutes in and out. It's going to be awesome. That's, that's why you need the guys who go on at length like me, get philosophical and all that. So <laughs> exactly. We, we need all kinds. We just need to fill up the space and time and not, not make it too short. So that's funny. Well, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, you and Paul go back some, some ways. We do. Yeah. I was running a podcast for a while where we talked about our favorite books. I think that's how Paul, you and I initially connected. So I interviewed you first. We definitely share some links in terms of faith background. And we, you know, those have both been interesting and wild journeys for the both of us. And uh, so yeah, we have realized through the course of that conversation and then maybe it's a follow-up com follow conversations that we had a lot in common. We both kind of got pulled into the agency world of creating content and helping executives and entrepreneurs create content for themselves and their companies so that that we had a lot in common we both done consulting which is kind of how we got into this so yeah there's definitely a lot that we um a lot that we share and a lot of similar beliefs and we just we we like to take things apart with our with our brains and think about them yes. and then put them back together and and i that's that's one of my favorite things about talking to you and today uh we're going to do that um as opposed to ideas, we're going to do that with a person and a message um, that you've been spreading for a little while now. So, you know, this is, I think this is two or three years in now, Matt, but um, I, want to, I want to start by just going back to, you had this idea, and I remember getting the occasional message from you about it, watching your own, uh, social media posts, talking about various ideas, but um, this whole concept of, of someone becoming micro-famous, you suddenly felt the need to spread this message and it's, it's paid off for you in some interesting ways, but, uh, take us back there. And how did, how did this first bubble up for you? Well, I would say it bubbled up from watching my own experience, number one in the podcasting world and what worked and what didn't. And then as I got into helping other people, realizing that the prevailing ideas in marketing were more hurtful to the average entrepreneur or executive or thought leader than they were helpful. So we live in a world where Gary V gets almost as many internet searches as the entire phrase digital marketing, mm. right? So people search about 800,000 times a year for the phrase digital marketing. Gary V gets about 500,000 searches a year. So if that tells you how much mind share he takes up in the space of people that when they think about marketing, they think of Gary V and they think of his approach. And what they take away from that is that, well, I need to be everywhere saying everything all the time at maximum, maximum volume. And, um, so I just saw, I saw the practical effect of that, right? The practical effect of that on my clients and my friends and my social circle was that everything, everyone was beating them up constantly for not being everywhere all the time or struggling to keep up with their commitment to do that. Um, dealing with the, the guilt, the, um, the frustration of not growing as fast as they think that they should have mm -hmm. while also attracting audience of people that didn't really buy from them because they weren't all the right people because they were just saying a bunch of things online trying to get attention. So anyway, I was on the back end of this and they would come to me and they want to launch a podcast and they'd come in with that mentality. Right. And some the goal of the book was, I mean, I, I'd always wanted to write a book. I had written one already that sat on the shelf that I never released for various reasons. And so I knew I wanted to write something at some point, but that seemed like the right time to do it. Because if I could get clients that had agreed with me first on my core idea of the book, 
then not only would that be better for me as an agency owner and a business person, but it'd be way better for them because I wouldn't have to try to get them to agree with me on these things after they were already clients and after they launched their show. Um, cause most of the battles for whether a podcast grows or a brand grows are long, you know, they're, they're won and lost before you even launch the show or launch your brand, yeah. right? It's the, you know, the, the battleground is all up in your head before you ever put it into the world. Sure. So, yeah. um, yeah, so that it was, it was a combination of inner drive to write, which I'm sure your audience can relate to. They're not here unless they're have already written something. They've thinking about writing something or whatever. That's the way I was right. Like I've, I've been reading, I like Paul, I've told you this. I started reading theology books when I was eight. Yeah. Like I, I, I knew I wanted to write something. I wasn't quite sure what that would end up being. Uh, and this is the first thing I'll probably write something else completely different later, but this is like the thing where I was like, okay, there's a need for it. It benefits the business so I can justify it that way. But it was like, I, I, I knew I wanted to write something anyway. There was just that drive to write. So that was the, that was the combination. You know, what it sounds like from that, Matt, is that this is, this is something akin to what I've discovered really drives me as the, the ghostwriter and the interlocutor for the, the person who's struggling to get their message out. It really bothers me from personal experience speaking in plain English and yet not being understood yeah, or speaking in a perfectly normal tone of voice. And yet people say to me, I'm not convinced mm -hmm. or, you know, speaking at a, at, even at a, at a slightly elevated volume, not like shouting, but raising my voice so that I can be heard. And yet people take no note of it. They're not impacted by it. And so that, that what grinds my gears there is the idea that somehow, even though I'm a human being gifted by God with articulate speech, I can't make myself understood. I'm talking mm -hmm. to a wall. And then I hear you say that. And what it sounds like to me is that if, if we were to put words to it, is that you see all these people absorbing all of this constant, um, battering ram of you got to be here. You got to be there. You got to be everywhere all the time saying everything the loudest you possibly can. And that, it sounds like that would have really frustrated you on behalf of somebody, if not as well as yourself to have to listen to that and then just go along and say, Hey, that's, that's just the way it is. It sounds like that's, it's, that was almost like a, mm -hmm. some, something of an injustice for you. Oh, totally. Yes. Uh, yes. The book was a quest to set out and to write that injustice. That's totally true. Uh, which I mean, how, how many, how many of the best books are like that? You know, um, you see a problem in the world and you set out to solve it, hopefully with your book. Um, yeah. But yes, uh, so when it comes to, when it comes to authors, I think there's probably a lot of authors and would be authors that, that can totally identify with that feeling. And I, and I can too. So I'm a natural introvert. I'm not interested in being the loudest person in the room. I'm definitely not interested in being the most frequent speaker in any room that I'm in. I want to get up and say my piece and have it, I, I want it to slam people right between the eyes without me having to raise my voice and then sit down. And I want my stuff to be the thing that wakes them up at night. And they go, man, like, I can't stop thinking about what he said. Yeah. And yeah. then that takes, that takes some work to break through to that level to where you you reach that level of what I would call clear and compelling. That's what the book talks about. That's kind of like the central idea is that, look, if you, if you cannot or will not be the loudest and the most odd, the, the, the person with the most volume, putting the most content out there, it's like, well, what is the answer? Well, the answer is you don't need to be Gary Vee. You need to be Simon Sinek, which is that you come out and you say something that's so incredibly razor sharp, clear, and it's emotionally compelling and interesting and arresting and attention grabbing you know, completely on its own that you don't have to be the loudest person in the room to get that message heard. You can say it once and it sticks with people. And once they hear it, they can't unhear it. Yeah. Right. So it's like that's... Um, I, I saw that work with two different podcasts I was running at the same time. I've told you this story before, you know, in real estate running one that had a mass audience and one that had a super niche affluent audience. And the one that had that smaller audience was way easier to monetize, was way easier to get the message out. And it made more of an impact than my other show that had 10, 20, 50 times the download sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's like, until you have that experience, it's like, and you viscerally see it that way. And you're literally split testing by complete accident in real life. It doesn't, it's hard to convince people of that. Yeah. So the book was an effort to, without, without being able to help people go through that same experience, to share how I came across it. And then to give some examples like the Simon Sinek versus Gary Vee, mm. where people can go, oh, okay, you're right. I don't want to be Gary Vee. I want to be Simon Sinek. That sounds way better. Let's go do that. It's like, awesome. Now I can help. 
once yeah. you've made that decision, it's like, then they agree with me on the main core thing. Then if we work together, way easier. But even if we don't work together, I know that I've made a positive Im impact on them. That's going to make their life way, way better. Because there's a connection there too, I think, uh, in a way like, you know, I, I've never paid attention to Gary Vee, nothing against him. I just, I've, I've never yeah, paid attention not your to style. Him. But I have paid attention to some other pretty loud people um, in the past. And for the first little while, when I was brand new, didn't know any better, I was like, it's awesome. That's great. And then I, then I run up against the reality. I, that kind of runs against the grain of how I am. But then I come across somebody who does it much more smooth and low key and doesn't need to be in the limelight, but when they speak it, you know, it, it goes 10,000 miles deep. And so it sounds, you know, I, it sounds like what you're doing, what you're offering to people through this is that same kind of connection that Simon Sinek offers to people. to so all of us, the majority of us, I say, who just simply don't have that loud bombast to our personality and, uh, you know, and, and yet there's, there's, I would argue there's, there's as much, if not more hope if you're quiet, mm -hmm. um, by comparison. I hope so. I mean, yeah, that would be, that would be an amazing outcome from the book is to give people that are kind of frustrated and struggling with the Gary Vee approach, hope that the, the hope isn't that someday I'll figure out how to be everywhere, everywhere all the time at maximum volume. And I'll just kind of figure out how to do that. The hope is that you don't have to do that and you can actually go deeper into the message and you can sharpen your message to the point where the message does the hard work. And that's a pretty good spot to be in. You know, yeah. like when you think about somebody like a Simon Sinek, you know, he's got a much bigger platform. You know, he's speaking to fortune 500 companies. He's doing not TEDx, you know, San Antonio. He's doing like legit national stage TED talks. He's got national media exposure. It's like, okay, he's got a, he's got a big time national platform. Well, what if you're not there yet? Well, the New York times is not going to write about you. The wall street journal is not going to put you into its business, but like then they're just not going to feature you yet. It's like, so you got to have some sort of platform where your clear and compelling idea can kind of get out into the world. Podcasting, I think, is one of the best ways that you can do that, which is why I gravitated into the space. But you need something, right? Because if you don't have the advantages that Simon Sinek has of having a TED talk that goes viral and, and then all the, the press and the attention and the, the mass PR that comes with that, like you got to have some sort of platform. You have to have a way to get your, your message out. So anyway... Mm -hmm. That, that is the hope is that there is a way to package up an idea in a way that's clear and compelling and put it into a vehicle to where the vehicle does a lot of work for you. And it's not up to you to pick up your phone 17 times a day and do selfies and videos because yeah. that really is the choice. It's like, if you're going to go down the Gary V route, like welcome to make that, making that your entire world. Yeah. So anyway, that, yes, that I, it would be a great. It would be a great accomplishment if the book can do that for some people. And we were talking about this before we, we hit record. Um, the practical effect that I've noticed is that when I have people that come into my world that have any kind of exposure to the book, either they, they, they read it when it came out. I just had a client come into me the other day and said he just bought the book and read it. Like he bought it off Amazon uh, within the last couple of months. I'm like, awesome. But when they come in, they come in going, yeah, not only do I want to want to launch a podcast in general, not only do I want to work with you specifically, but I want to work with you because I want to do this system. I want to do right. this strategy from the book. And it's like, well, that there is no competition at that. Point. I mean, I can't charge anything I want, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's prices is, is not an issue at that point because they're not choosing between me and some other vendor. And if the other vendor beats me about a hundred bucks, I, I lose. Like that's that, yeah. that, that word. That's not even the conversation. The conversation is, man, I hope I can afford you because yeah. I really want to work with you. And that's one of the things that I think a book can give any author is it takes away a lot of the, like it gives you price elasticity, right? It takes price out of the conversation. Now the question is, they really, really want you. The question is, can they afford you because of how awesome you are? Like that's yeah. a really good spot to be in as any kind of thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, comes, go ahead. You, you, you finish your thought, Paul. I just said the, the brief, um, cherry on the top of that is yeah it's it's a it's a it's kind of reminds me of that uh you know being in that blue ocean where yeah you're you've put yourself in a class by yourself yeah. um and then the person interacting with you is so bought into the idea the way you communicated it 
that to them, all the other ideas, it's a waste of time to even read them. Yeah. So. Yeah. They come to you pre-decided. Yeah. The word that comes to my mind is influence. And I think that writing a book gives you a, more influence than other folks because a person, the reader begins to know the, the writer better yeah. on what they perceive to be a personal level, even though they might be talking about a, for some sort of professional topic, marketing or something like that. The fact that there are so many words that are being passed from the writer to the reader, it, I think it, in, it, in, it engenders the, the reader to that, to that writer in a way that um, the sound bites on social media just don't do. You know, you can, you can just have yeah. just so many short little tweets, uh, you'd be, but a book that's 50, 60,000, 80,000 words, you feel like you might know that person and mm -hmm. to do business with them. Now it just becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like it doesn't, uh, like I, I think short form content is the way to get in front of people initially, but I can't imagine building up any kind of like long-term relationship with somebody like a Tim Ferriss or a Robert Greene or Seth Godin through 60 second sound bites on TikTok. You know, like there's just not, it doesn't give you, so influence is a good way to put it, uh, respect, credibility, you know, are other things that are kind of part of influence that like, if you don't earn somebody's respect, it's really hard to be influenced by them. It's kind of a prerequisite. And it's just, man, to get attention on social media in short form video content, it's really hard to be respectable, right? So we all look at Gary V as an example, but we have to remember that Gary V, at least up until now, he's, he's now getting into his mid to late forties. So we'll see how this continues. But so far, Gary V kind of has like a kid-like vibe and a kid-like enthusiasm for social media. And a lot of his audiences are, are they're in their twenties, like they're young up and coming hustlers. You can tell by the content that Gary V produces, he's talking to a lot of kids in their twenties, right? H how many of that is us? trying to sell, you know, build, a, build ourselves up as a thought leader, selling high dollar B2B services and products. And you know what I'm saying? Speaking at big companies like, like Gary V builds an audience of people on social media that are not the people he sells to so that he can take the people that he sells to and go, hey, I know how to do this and I can do it for you. Like he has a completely different sales model than most of us are trying to build. And everybody that's trying to follow him is trying to build an audience of people they sell to. But that's not actually what Gary V does. Yeah. Gary V builds an audience of people he doesn't sell to outside of maybe some books, which he breaks even on essentially. And then he sells to a completely different audience, completely different audience. Like that is the genius of what he's done for many reasons. But anyway, we just have to realize that, um, that, that is a, he is not selling to his social media audience. Yeah. That thought ties back into a, I want to, I want to unwind about 10 minutes here to a, to a, a way station that we paused briefly at, which is you made a comment that, uh, uh that you want to, you want your, what you said to, to be the thought that awakens a person at night <laughs> and they start re, re, they start ruminating on it. Yeah. Now, uh, let's compare and contrast for just a moment, the Gary V. Uh, and this is not a pick on Gary V session, but the Gary V principle of there's a lot of, there's a lot of messages out there. You have to be among them. Just become, a, just be noticed, do something to become noticed, mm -hmm. right? Which okay. Gary V didn't invent any of that. Uh, Richard Branson, perhaps in my lifetime was very good at that, yep. right? Why, why have, uh, why get in a, you know, a balloon and travel around the world? Why, you know? <laughs> What does that have to do with hotels and cruises yeah. and stuff, right? It's, well, he wanted to do it, yeah, right? And he could, and he became noticed for it. Uh, and his Virgin brand, very popular, hundreds of businesses throughout the world. Uh, contrasting that then with the idea that um, you have a handful of things that you want to say, but they're all super meaningful. Mm -hmm. People might not notice you as quickly, but when they do, there's tremendous value in that. Yeah. I feel like those are on some sort of a spectrum. And when a person gets into this book writing mode, 
my experience has been most of those people are in the, I hope I say something that's valuable camp. And they spend so much time ruminating over their ideas. What is the idea that's going to be magical? That's going to keep this person up at night that they never finish their book mm. versus a Gary V who says, Hey, put the 10 second soundbite out there. It doesn't matter because they're going to forget about that anyhow, but they will remember you over time. Yeah. Yeah. And I get where he's coming from with that. But for most entrepreneurs that are solo or very, or very small team leaders, which all of us really fall into, like I've got a team of 12 for the agency, but that's even in the big scheme of things, that's a small team. Uh, when it comes to marketing for the agency, it's me. Like I don't have a, I don't have a 19 person brand content team. Like, like Gary V has, it's probably bigger now. That was, a, that figure was from a few years ago. Um, it's yes, it's easy to get bogged down in writing a book. That's true. Uh, I would say, um, the best thing you can do for, for book writing and the same thing for a podcast is narrow it down to the handful of things that you feel are the most important things that you'd want people to agree with you on when they get finished with that piece of content. I got in, in the context of podcasting, I'll call those buying beliefs. I'm sure other people have maybe similar names for it. But anyway, when I work with a client, I want to get them down to like the top five things they care about that if people agree with those five things. They're going to be amazing, ideal clients for them. But out of those five things, there's one thing that's usually like, what would you call it? It's like the, the, the trigger. It's the tripwire. It's like it's the first thing they've got to believe before they can really sign on to the rest of it, right? Um, that's usually what I try to put nudge people into basing their podcast around. And if I was in your position of coaching people on books and helping them produce books, I would nudge them to build the book around that. It's like you may care deeply about five things. But odds are there's probably one idea or belief that comes first that's a tripwire before they can really sign on to the rest of those beliefs. Build, build the book or the, or the podcast around that thing and then build the book around reinforcing that idea in a thousand ways. Because most people are really have a hard time with coming away from a book with, with more than one central idea. Anyway, yeah. like they can come away with tactics. They can come, come away with smaller takeaways and stuff like that. But I mean, just rem remember reading Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. We all came away with the one idea that, Hey, this is all the rest of the stuff was like interesting. It was just the inspiration to like, just go down that path towards this vague idea of having a business that you could run in four hours a week, which I, which I ended up doing through a completely different route than anything of what was suggested in that book. None yeah. of the stuff that was in that book worked for me, but the, but the one idea I took away changed my life, right? That's like, that's a, that's a great impactful book. So yeah, it's, um, I think if people spend their time figuring out what that is, they'd be very good, but, um, it's, uh, it's worth spending time there, not to the point where it bogs you down and it keeps you from putting anything out in the world, but it is worth time spending. It's worth the time spending, investing to figure out what that idea is. And if you need to put some content in the meantime and see what people respond to, great, do it. Like, like there's, there's a lot to be said for testing ideas and stuff like that. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, it's always a balance when you're writing a book or doing any big project like that to want to do it right so that it's impactful, but not to the point where you never get it done. And there's, not, my, I don't think there's a right answer to that. Yeah. And in my yeah. experience, that is very hard to do alone. Impossible. Because yes, you're, impossible. Okay. Because I, it feels like, um, it's like singing in the shower, right? <laughs> the shower is yeah. a fantastic place to sing. There's so much resonance that you sound amazing. Mm. Um, and if you, that's a, that's a good analogy. I like it. And, and it's only your voice. Yeah. Right. Uh, you don't sound that good if you just sing raw into a microphone. Well, speak for yourself. I sound fantastic <laughs> in the shower. <laughs> well, when we said we, you're, you're only your voice, I was like, I don't know. That's even true. Jason's <laughs> next, next book title, by the way. Depends on how many people are in the shower. With harmony. You. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Four part harmony in the shower. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it, I do really think that if this process of coming up with what is vitally important to say, uh, it has to be done in community. It has to be done with other people. We cannot really do it on our own. Either we can't 
obtain the information or get that information, see it, mm. uh, without the help of somebody else, we wouldn't know maybe. So like, you know, you're the, the ideas that you're espousing are not necessarily new, but they are, that they are new in the way you presented them and brought them all together. Mm. So for the collection of what is available to me as a, as a writer, I have to, I have to see all of those options, all of those paths we could go down to then go, okay, well, what do I want to say about this? And then, yeah. and yeah. then put that into the world, which I guess the, the end, the end cap on that is, um, I guess my thought is to ruminate less on what is the best. Don't sacrifice, don't sacrifice getting, uh, getting it done for, uh, yes. you know, done is done is better than perfect. I think done in, is in better some than some regards. Perfect. Yeah. And the one, there was something that, um, uh, Sam Carpenter said this, he wrote this book called work the system. And then he wrote this, uh, systems mindset, which is one of my most favorite books of all time. He said something about his first book. He's like, I didn't plan to approach a tra traditional publisher until my book was on version three or four. So he's self-published then re-edited, revised, self-published again and again, and then pr approached a traditional publisher, got it published, and then was able to write his second book that was more of a mass audience. Like there's just, there's nothing wrong with it being a process, getting something done now that's like a credibility piece and it gets you in, in the door. Uh, it gets you on podcasts, which, which I've taken, you know, I probably closed six figures in business from just one of the podcasts I was on as a result of doing interviews around the book. Right. So it gets you all that stuff. But yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm rewriting the book to, to update it. Um, my girl who has written three books, uh, is rewriting and revising the book that she wrote seven years ago, uh, and re-updating it for, for a new, for a new generation, basically, right. And like a new, new set of readers. Um, there's nothing wrong with looking at your book as a software that can be upgraded. It is not a, it is not cemented in time and can yeah. never be adjusted from now till eternity. You know, um, it just isn't, you can look at it, the software that can be upgraded. And I think that takes a lot of the fear out that everything has to be perfect right off the bat. Now, does it have to be professionally edited and produced? Yes. It doesn't have to be the ultimate statement of you as a human being, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, you can, you can name a lot of authors that did not come out of the gate like Tim Ferriss, where their first book was their biggest seller. Like most people it's their fourth or fifth or like Rachel Hollis is a good example. That was the uh, girl wash your face was like her sixth book or something like that. Like she put a handful of other books out there that I don't even know the names of them because who cares that yeah. like, it's more likely that you're like that. And that's perfectly okay because those books each did something for her on the way up to the book that now we all know. So I think if, if authors understand that, that it doesn't matter if this is the be all end all, it doesn't matter if it's your ultimate statement of you as a human being. Um, it doesn't have to be any of those things for it to be absolutely worth it to do the book. Yeah. Uh, the saying I use is the first time's the worst time. Yeah. And if you can just settle into that, you can do anything. <laughs> that is true. Just the first time's the worst time. Doesn't yeah. mean the hundredth is, isn't going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And by the, and you, and I, I use that analogy also for people who are like, I don't like doing, you know, what you name it. I don't, I'm not going to like that job. It's like, you've never done the job. You have no idea. Just do it. <laughs> it might, it might be great. Yeah. It might be terrible. Done. Who knows? Yeah. You might fall in love. So, uh, the, 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 the book also, I want to, I want to touch on this idea that, um, the, the what's for me and what's for thee concept. Mm. Okay. I think, I think writers sometimes struggle with that too. They have a lot of things they want to say, but that's for me and not for thee. Mm. When you were going through your book, take me around the circumstances or I think our listeners around the circumstances, what was going on? Why did a book come into view for you? Why did you need to write that book? How was it going to serve you in your ecosystem? And how did you make the decision of, okay, what's, what if this is for me because of what's going on in my life versus what is this, what if this is for the, uh, that I want to say to the world? I know there's a lot in all that question, but take it. Yeah, step. that's a very, that's a, but it's a good way to, to phrase it. Okay. So I would say what people wanted and expected from me was a book about the tactics of how to build a great business podcast with a lot of listeners, right? What I wanted them to understand is that the way to do that is to think about branding and your whole marketing strategy differently. So I broke the book up into three parts. The first part was strategy, and I tried to make that very 
blog post style, digestible, short chunks, you know, chapters with, uh, with illustrations and stuff like that, just to lighten the mental load of it. And, um, cause that was the part that like they, that was like the foundation. That was the part they needed to understand. It was the part that I needed to get out of me. And it was the part that if they went through it, they'd make, it'd make them better clients for me and it'd be better off for them. Then the next parts were tactics, right? Uh, and implementation and things like that. So, uh, I put the parts that I felt like they wanted in the middle and end so that they had to go through the part that I felt like they needed in the beginning first to get to it. You know, I don't know if that strategy worked or not. You'd have to ask people that, that read the book to see if that was effective. But, uh, yeah, like I wanted to expose people to the ideas that I felt like were important before they got to the tactic stuff that they thought was important that I knew was actually less important. Uh, so I don't know if I did that correctly. There's plenty of other authors that do, you know, the, uh, something very different, like Tim Ferriss at the four hour, the four hour chef. That was a book about accelerated learning. I didn't buy it because I'm not interested in learning how to cook, but it's like, but, it's, but he, so he, he made a strategic decision to package up this book about accelerated learning around a concept that it turns out part of his audience doesn't care about. Yeah. No. So it's like he tried to bridge that gap of like the things that he wanted to talk about with what he thought would sell. And the book did great for him. So like I'm, I'm probably in the minority of people that didn't, didn't go buy that book. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of people that did, but that's, that's always that, like that's such a hard decision for any author to make and no one gets it perfect. Uh, it, even, even Tim Ferriss didn't satisfy his entire audience because I didn't go out and buy that book. I went and bought his other, all of the, all his other books. So it's that, that's a very, um, I think that's a very personal thing and it's never going to be hundred percent right. You just have to live with that. It probably goes back into how one would measure success of their efforts or return yeah. on their efforts. Yeah. So how do you measure that with your book? Um, well, I gave you the example of a couple of clients that have come in that said, Hey, I read your book and I'm ready to do the strategy. I'm not going to work with anybody else. That is super helpful. I've also just noticed that the book, uh, the book opens doors and got me on podcast and that indirectly led to revenue. Um, that was good enough, right? Like I'm, I'm in the space where I need a couple of good clients, uh, you know, a quarter to come into the business. I like, it's a lifestyle business and I only want to work with people that I like, that I genuinely believe that I can help and then I can make a big difference in their life and that puts out content that's genuinely helpful to their audience. So there's a, that's a lot of criteria, right? I'm not building a business to scale and sell. If I was, that'd be a different story, but that that's because I don't need a ton of clients. I needed the right clients. The book helped me do that. So it's like, okay, great mission accomplished. Um, if I was going to go for a mass appeal book, again, I would still go for what's going to get me on podcasts. Cause of all the authors that I've talked to, like Michael McCallowitz and Jay Samet and, and, um, who wrote disrupt you and, and all these other guys that I've talked to, um, the guy that wrote the perfect day, Craig, I forget his last Craig name. Valentine. Anyway, they've all, yes, Craig Ballantyne. Yes. They've all told me some variation of the same thing, which is the, like nothing else worked. The marketing team at my publishers were, you know, clueless, you know, Harper Collins didn't do anything for me. What did something for me, what moved the needle was getting on podcasts and getting interviewed. It's like, okay, great. So if, like, if your book does that, that will get you business, that will get you clients, that will get you speaking gigs, that will do a lot for you. So to me, that'd be like the number one criteria for success. Anything after that would be great. Be like book sales, revenue, um, speaking gigs that come directly from people buying the book off of Amazon. Like I, one of my clients is uh, Michael Mayer, who wrote The Seven Levels of Communication. They, they sell thousands of copies of that book a year just from people hearing about it from other people and just going and buying it on Amazon. And then they have to try to get people to get into their email list. That is a great problem to have. But that was just because he tried to write the best book possible that had the widest appeal to the right person for him. And it just happened to hit same thing mm -hmm. with miracle morning. Like none of those guys really approached it strategically to get that kind of an outcome from the book. They just tried to write the best book they could and the chips fell where they did. And now they're in a position where their books sell continuously. And that's a good position to be in. But if you don't get to that, that's okay. Cause there's a bunch of other ways to make a book work out for you. Um, I told one of my other clients who's in the executive recruiting space, like his, every single time he places an executive, he's getting a 30% fee of their multi, multi six figure salary. So one client is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, go write a book and then have somebody just direct mail the books to all the CEOs and C-suite executives at the top 100 companies you want to work for. He still hasn't done it. 
Now, granted, that's partly because the podcast is doing well enough that his business keeps him as busy as he's willing to be. It's like, well, I can't help that. Like, I can't, I can't create another you. I can't clone you. But if you wanted more business, that's what I would do. Like, you don't have to, um, you don't have to get, your book doesn't have to get you on the radio. Your book doesn't have to get you a Super Bowl ad. Your book doesn't have to get you on Good Morning America. It doesn't have to do any of those things. If it gives you something that is worth direct mailing to the exact right kind of people that can turn around and hand you 50 or 100 grand or invest in your real estate syndication deal you're putting together, like whatever it is, um, to me, that, that would also be a really great outcome for most of the people that you and I know and work with. Yeah. Yeah. So how sure were you, you, you uh, in, in the context of, of success, like you've just talked about, mm. you know, the return on investment, how sure were you of the return on investment when you embarked on, upon this journey of writing a book? Give me your percentage. Like, were you like, eh, I, back in the envelope math, that's 50% that's going to be valuable, 80% that's going to be valuable. Where, where were you, where was your mind? That is a great question that nobody's ever asked me. And I, I would have to peg it at 80 or 90% because I knew the podcast landscape and I knew that the book would unlock a lot of opportunities to get interviewed. And I knew that would do a lot. So it's like, that was like, that was my kind of number one criteria for success. Anything above that was gravy. So I was, I was sure that it would do that. And I was sure that if I get interviewed on podcasts, people will resonate with that and reach out. That I was sure. Mm. Anything beyond that, I was like, yeah, like I'm, I'm a short-term pessimist, a long-term optimist. So it's like any, anything beyond that, it's like, eh, probably won't happen. It probably won't sell a bunch of copies and that's okay. That, that was my mentality going in. I wanted to structure it in such a way. And this is what I would tell any entrepreneur or executive. Unless you have a massive PR team behind you, structure things in such a way that the book will get you exposure in the right places where your ideal people are listening. And then beyond that, like completely let go of any attachment to the outcome. Don't plan on revenue from the book. Don't, don't assume it's, you know, it's going to be something that just has passive people coming in and buying it. Like to just, just structure it in such a way and structure your expectations to where just putting the book out and doing something productive with the book gets you the results that you want and gets you the return that you want. Cause that's possible. And then you can just let go of the attachment to the rest of it. Yeah. That yeah. Would be my advice. And you can, and, and like what, what we're seeing with our authors is it's the, it's not the book by itself. It's the combination of its availability, the distillation of what they believe, think, know, et cetera, and their presence that's yeah. really causing momentum for them. Pre presence as in visibility online whether yeah, they're, they're on a the podcast book. or they're on a youtube or they're or they're speaking from a stage they're at, you know they're yeah. teaching a workshop whatever the case may be mm -hmm. <clears throat> the combination of those two things mm -hmm. drives it in a myriad of ways it can drive book sales yes but it also can drive people like walk up and say i want to work with you mm -hmm. i want you to do this for me i want you to be my whatever right yeah yeah it's it just it, you need the two of them just like you need, uh, throughout the history, uh, it, it, it would be way better, you know, our, pardon me for getting philosophical here for a moment on the emissary authors podcast, which I never do running joke, <laughs> but <laughs> wouldn't it be way easier today to understand and settle our constitutional debates if the founding fathers were around to explain to us what they meant when they wrote what they wrote? Oh man. Um, yes. Nobody would like what they had to say. I know they wouldn't like what they had to say, but we could at least have them say, this is what I meant. Yeah. I think the vast majority of the population will go, oh, I want those guys idiots. We got to stop listening to them. But yeah. Yes, right. You're right. It would be, them. it would be Absolutely. nice if they were around. Absolutely. They would be canceled. No question. However, <laughs> we would know what they meant. Yes, we would. <laughs> I think so, a good lesson in all of that though, uh, is my inkling would be that ev all of us would be offended in some way. Yeah. Um, because even they, and this gets, it will circle back. Uh, we'll take your philosophical, uh, thing and pull it back in. Uh, <laughs> e e I, I think they, they didn't all agree. Yeah. Uh, that's well established. They didn't all agree. Um, but they did agree to a handful of principles. So getting back to this idea of book writing and, and, and being present the author being present, you know, out in the community and whether that's podcasts, whether it's events or whether it's, you know, their local chamber or something like that. Uh, the 
here's what I need to tell you. And then I reinforce that with sound bites, perhaps with questions that allow me to dig deeper when that is necessary. I might even refine my ideas as a re as an author to better able to show up tomorrow and maybe a year from now or five years from now, do a second version of my book mm -hmm. or, you know, you, you talk about visibility, what's after podcasts. I don't know, you know, who knows what, how, how we might be, you know, communicating with one another. That's right. As, as technology changes and you might, you might have something new. I'm still yeah, waiting for the Star Wars pursuing. hologram to be a thing. Why is that not a thing yet? <laughs> <laughs> They're working on it. They're trying. Yeah, can't be far away now. Pretty soon we're going to be all be all be wearing the big glasses oh, and walking around. Not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah, that, get, that trend, I will gladly let that trend pass me right by. <laughs> At that stage, you know, I can actually eat lunch in my kitchen, but be in Jason's living room a hologram of me eating lunch while he's eating lunch. Yeah. That way we can have a, you know, a, a lunch, a strategy lunch without leaving our homes. <laughs> That's right. It'd be well, great. It's going to be awesome. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, yeah, and I think fun. one that's, that we have, uh, touched on things that I think many of our, our, our listeners and I, and, and knowing the audience that, that, uh, that does listen to this podcast, knowing aspiring writers, I think we have touched on some, on some of the things that do keep them up at night, uh, and, and prevent them, prevent the writers from moving forward. If they're an aspiring writer, I hear it all too often, not sure what to write, not sure if it's valuable, uh, to so many questions around that. And I think we've, we've successfully answered those questions. And then a lot of, a lot of people write books and they go nowhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's important to adjust expectations and look for alternative ways of value creation. If nothing else, I believe that the process of writing a book distills, offers, offers the writer an opportunity to distill their thoughts into the meaningful sound bites that then can be expanded upon. But if a person does not, if a person does not critically look at their own thinking and clarity of communication, then I think that people don't even know what they think. <laughs> you may be right about that. It's, it's a stream of yeah. consciousness, but it's never yeah. been collected into these are actually my beliefs. Yeah. And yeah, until you pit that, them against each other and have to yeah. decide what you care the most about saying in the world. Yeah. Like it's just, you just kind of speak what you feel in the moment. It's when you're forced to fight over okay, what are the handful of things I really care about saying? And out of those, okay, what's the most important thing I can say right now in this moment to an audience, you know, for the next couple of years around this book? Um, yeah, it really does force you to get really clear about what you mm -hmm. care the most about. Yeah, I, there's a, I'll, I'm stealing this from somebody else, but the, the idea that we believe competing thoughts uh, is not something that we give enough credit that, that, that we don't give enough credit to that thought. So the yeah. earlier bird gets the worm, right? We all kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Good things come to those who wait. Mm -hmm. We kind of believe that too. So which one is it? <laughs> Either the uh, earlier bird gets the worm or the good so things true. come to those who wait. Yeah. And, and the truth is it's contextual and we'd all have stories of when I was the early bird and I got the worm and then good things were come to those who wait. And then sometimes I never did anything and that was the best decision. So. I think contextualizing our own beliefs and if we're in business, the things that we would say to our clients, contextualizing all those in the form of a book is highly valuable for the writer yeah. first and foremost. And if sure. it's highly valuable for the writer, it's a good chance it's going to be highly valuable for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, writing a book will change everything. It'll change how you talk about yourself. It'll change how you talk about your ideas. It'll change how you talk about your business. It'll change how you run your sales calls. If you're still on sales calls, it'll change how you take speaking engagements. It'll change what you talk about on stage and how you affect the audience. It will literally change everything. Hmm. Well, there's the sound bite. <laughs> there you go. You did it. <laughs> By complete accident. Which are the best ones? We'll put that on social media and it'll, it'll, Gary V will be wiped out. Exactly. Be, Tsunami of views. And all of a sudden, 
you'll be inundated with requests to work with you according to the dictates of Microfamous as well. Ex as exactly. Well, exactly the way you laid it out. <laughs> Matt Johnson joining us on the Emissary Author Podcast. Great to have you, my friend. Great to chat again. Great to unpack what's going on inside that brain of yours. We appreciate you. And uh, we, my, myself, Paul Edwards and Jason Todd, are the co-hosts of this show where we help faith-based founders, executives, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. Will yours be next? Only time will tell. We'll talk soon. See you next time.